This little motherboard is the size of a three and a half inch hard drive, yet it has a 10 core CPU. It has DDR5 slots, many M.2 slots, and there are two two and a half gig NICs that we've never seen before. Oh, and it can support up to four display outputs. It can have an array of COM and USB ports, and you can even get it in a fanless system. Guys, this thing is super cool, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is the Supermicro X13 SAN-H. Now, something you might see is that uh, I have a hard drive here because yes, this is a three and a half inch single board computer that's about the size of a three and a half inch hard drive. You can kind of see this right here. They're about the same size, but you're also going to see that we have this system, which is the Supermicro Sys E113 AD H, which is a long name, but you're going to see that uh, this motherboard is pretty similar to what's in here. The big difference is that the motherboard in here is the Supermicro X13 SANH WOHS, and that WOHS means without heatsink, but I usually call it the woes. So Supermicro sent these systems just to go review, but they have no idea that we're even doing a video on this, so we're going to say it's sponsored, but realistically, they have no idea this is even happening. Before we get to the hardware, I want to say thank you really quickly to the STH YouTube members who help support us so we can do things like buy stuff to go put in these little systems. Since we're going to be doing the motherboard and the system version of this in one video, let's get to the hardware because I think that's a great place to start. Okay, since this is the motherboard that's inside the system, I figured let's just use the system so I can kind of show you the outside of the system, the external bits, and then we'll show you the motherboard in a little bit more detail when we get inside the system. Okay, so starting with the system, I just want to kind of show you guys this real quick. Uh, you see that we have a nice like ribbed thing up here. This is a pretty darn heavy chassis. The bottom, uh, you know, we have some feet on. There is another option for a bottom that has like a little heat sink on the bottom. We're going to show you inside the system how this is used to cool the memory and storage and all that kind of stuff, uh, but we just don't have a big enough configuration. So this is fine for us. But I figured let's just go start on this side, which is well probably the rear side, to be honest. But uh, I think it's the most interesting. So we're going to start with that first. On this side of the system, you're going to see that we have two Intel i225IT NICs. Now, you might be wondering, uh, you've heard of like the Intel i225, what is the IT versus like an Intel i225V, which would be something that you would typically see like in a desktop or something like that. The IT is the version of the NIC that's really for the industrial grade temperatures and all that kind of stuff. And that's really a big part of the system. It's not just made for, you know, like a desktop. It's really made for being deployed out in the field where, you know, it's going to get some grime on it and all that kind of stuff. And so you get something like the IT NIC really for that embedded space. But both of these NIC ports are two and a half gig ethernet, which is pretty good. Now, a lot of systems that we've seen before use some of the extra PCIe lanes to go and put more two and a half gig NICs in the system. And if you want more NICs than this has, then this is the wrong platform for you, obviously. But for a lot of applications, two, two and a half gig NICs is plenty. Okay, now in the back of the system, you're going to see that we get two HDMI ports. One of these ports is an HDMI 2.0 B port. The other one is a 1.4 B port. So at this point, you're probably like, hey, I can go drive some displays out of this thing, right? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. However, it doesn't just stop there because we also have USB ports that we can use for things like display outputs. So you're going to see that we have two USB 3.2 Gen 2 10 gigabit per second ports, and these both can also run in display port output modes. So you can use like display port 1.4 alt mode and uh, have a total of four displays out of this little box. Now, aside from those two USB ports, you'll see that we also have two USB type A ports. Those two ports are also USB 3.2 Gen 2. So they're also 10 gigabit per second ports. Before we move on, a couple little features, you will see that we have two spots for an antenna on the back, and then we have this giant power button. I will say that one time when I took the system apart, I managed to pull out the power button, and uh, that, that was kind of a bummer. Now, I promised you that you could get more I.O. in this, and you can, and that is via the rear. You're going to see that we get a total of four COM ports. Now, a lot of folks are going to look at this and say, COM ports, I don't even, what the heck are those for? Those are so old, all that kind of stuff. And the answer is that there's a ton of industrial equipment that use the old like com serial ports. And if you just want to know why, you can see that you have the two screw in connectors and these things are a lot more secure than something like a USB port. And that's why, you know, a lot of a lot of things out in the industry use these kind of com ports. You may not use them, but there are a lot of folks that do. But something that I think uh, most people will use is that there are four USB 2 ports. Now, of course, you might be saying USB 2, that's kind of a bummer. One nice thing I found, though, is the fact that the USB 3 ports are on the other side of the chassis, USB 2 ports on the other one. So if you have something like 
like a wireless dongle, very easy to go put in this and it'll work no problem. Now, other features real quick, we get our GPIO pins over here, and then we get this little power input over here. So this system comes with a 12 volt, seven amp, so 84 watt FSP power adapter, which is way too much for the system. It doesn't use anywhere close to that much power. We'll show you that in the power and cooling section. But one of the cool features of this is that it has a connector that locks. So for example, what you can do is you just kind of plop this thing in and then you screw it in. And one of the cool things is that once this is done, you can't pull this out until you really unscrew it. But something you're probably gonna notice is that our motherboard doesn't have ports on this side, but it, there are ports here. So uh, let's get inside the system and figure out how that works. Okay, so opening the system, there are a total of eight screws on the bottom. And by the way, I just put these little feet on here. They came with the system. There's also an option to go have like DIN mounting rails and all that kind of stuff if you want to go mount it like that. Um, but one of the things that's a little bit of a pain with this is the fact that there are so many screws on the bottom. And then you kind of get the bottom off, but then you have to kind of peel it off because inside we get features. Okay, so this is the system is configured. Here's the motherboard. And of course, this is the dash H version. This is the woes version, which just means that it's sold without a heatsink. So that way it can be put into a, like a passive chassis like this. This one has the heatsink. Otherwise, they are the same motherboard. Now on the bottom of this, you're gonna see that we have our DDR5 slots on this side. Uh, which you can see over here, and we get dual channel memory, which is awesome. There are a lot of like, you know, the lower end systems, like the all E core systems that, um, you know, only have single channel memory. This particular motherboard has a Core i7, which is pretty darn awesome, guys. But the memory is far from the only expansion area that we have because we have these three M.2 slots over here, and they're all different. Okay, and it's kind of fun how this works. The top slot is a M.2 M key. The middle slot, this one is an E key and the bottom slot is a B key, or in other words, M-E-B. Now the M slot, I think a lot of folks are familiar with because that's what you would put like a SSD in and that's what we have in the system. The E slot is a little bit different. This is our wireless LAN and Bluetooth and stuff like that you'd put there. And so while our M key slot is a PCIe Gen 4 by four slot, the E key is only a PCIe Gen 3 by one, but it also has USB and uh, the CNVI stuff to be able to make like a wireless LAN card, like one of those work in the system. Okay, now this B key slot, this is a little bit different. So you get actually three different connections to it. So I think you get a USB like two, USB three, and then there's also a SATA connection to this down here. And the other kind of fun thing is that you're gonna see that there's a little nano SIM slot. So if you do wanna have like a uh, like 5G modem or something like that, you could do that here. And there's also a PCIe 3 by one lane here. Now, one of the other reasons that you have so many slots is also uh, this system is designed to be able to handle things like AI accelerators, like the Halo 8 or something like that. And if you don't know that one, that's like a 26 tops uh, AI accelerator and it runs, uh, I think like two and a half watts or something like that, it's pretty low power. And it's for a system just like this where you need some more embedded uh, AI acceleration and you can get that in a little form factor and put it on here too. Plus you can still have your SSD and wireless LAN if you need. Now, when we took this thing apart, it had so many cables in there that uh, I will admit the fact that a couple times I took it apart and I didn't put it together exactly properly. For example, um, I managed to pull out the cable that is connected to the power button, and that was a, a weird one to actually go do. But the overall motherboard is still very small. It's about the size of a three and a half inch hard drive. And on top here, the big feature, of course, is the fact that in this version, we have a Core i7 1265UE. Now that processor has 10 cores and 12 threads. So that means that we get eight E cores plus two P cores. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the efficient E cores and you also get a couple P cores, which are darn fast. Perhaps the best part of it though, is that this is only a 15 watt TDP CPU and it also includes an integrated GPU. This has like Intel Iris XE graphics, so you get a decent little integrated GPU, kind of like you would get in a low power desktop. The other big feature, of course, is the fact that you get the encode decode engines for video, and that's pretty important in a little edge box like this. The integrated GPU is also what powers our four display outputs. Now, of course, there are options for like other processors. We are looking at the Core i7 because it's like the high-end one, but there are other options. So if you just want something that's low power, but cost less, that's always possible. Let me just kind of 
show you around this motherboard, right? So we have this version with the heatsink here, but a couple features, like number one, there is a fan header. There's only one, but I don't really think you're gonna need more than one fan for such a low power system like this. Uh, then there's also the power input, which by the way, the power cable to this, when we did the last generation of the system, that was one of the hardest parts to get. So thankfully, uh, we, you know, we have the system which has the power cable and that's really nice. We also have the headers for our USB ports and COM ports. And that's really what's powering the back of the system over here. Two other kind of fun features. There is a Slim SAS by four. So this is a PCIe Gen 4 by four. So if you had like a fast NVMe SSD, you can actually connect it using this. You have to find power from somewhere, but you can definitely connect it using this little connector here. And there's also a single SATA port. So while this is the size of a hard drive, it can also connect a single SATA hard drive to this little port right here. And I know somebody's gonna ask this, so I just wanna kinda of show you guys real quick. Um, the size, this is a Raspberry Pi 5, so if you just wanna kinda of look at this thing size-wise, uh, you know, this is definitely a bigger platform, but it's also much faster, has more IO and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I know a lot of folks in the industrial market actually are using Raspberry Pis because they are cheap and uh, easy to get and integrate and all that kind of stuff. But something like a higher end x86 server, if you just need more performance, um, you know, that's a good reason to have something like this instead of this. The other key thing though, is that this is really designed for like industrial temperature ranges, whereas this is not. Okay, let's talk about the performance of the system, and it's actually pretty good. This system is powered by an Intel Core i7-1265UE. Now that is an Alder Lake generation processor, and it's also a 15 watt TDP CPU. So something about that means that number one, it's gonna idle at a very low level. It's also gonna have a little bit of burstiness to it, and then it's gonna come down to about that 15 watt range. We're gonna show you what the impacts are to the SOC power, as well as the you know load power and all that kind of stuff stuff and the total system power when we do our power consumption section after this section. Overall, the performance of this thing is pretty darn good. We're seeing performance that's, you know, well above something that would be kind of like a lower end system, but it's not necessarily anywhere near what you would get if you had a full like 65 watt TDP CPU or 45 watt TDP CPU, right? This is definitely a good bit below that. The reason for that is that we have only two P cores and we have E cores kind of filling in the rest of our 10 core CPU. And to me, that's actually kind of a cool combo because the E cores, you know, use less power. They're not running at the high frequencies that you see on the P cores. But when you do run on the P cores, you know, you can hit speeds well over four gigahertz on a modern Alder Lake P core. And that really gives you like desktop like performance, at least for those two cores and four threads. But frankly, there are a lot of applications that you might run on this that are gonna run perfectly fine on E-Cores. The E-Cores today are a lot better than the old Atom cores of, you know, yesteryear, right? These things are actually pretty fast. If you have something like a Intel Xeon E5 server, well, the E-Cores that are in this are probably faster than those cores are on a core for core basis kind of wild to think about that you have that much power in something that's the size of a hard drive. A couple quick compatibility things though, because we do have P cores and E cores in this Core i7 version, this isn't something that I would necessarily recommend for something like a VMware ESXi because, uh, well, that doesn't really support these like hybrid cores. But on the other hand, this thing is also on other compatibility lists, like for example, for Red Hat, this has a certification for that. So, you know, I know there are folks that are looking for things for work and stuff and they need like, oh, I need that Red Hat certification. This system is certified for that. But the question I'm sure you have at this point is, Patrick, what is the power consumption of this low power CPU? Well, for that, let's get to it next. Okay, so let's talk about the power consumption. But first, I want to show you something that is running right here and uh, we've had going for a little while now. And there's a good reason for that. This stress timer has been going for about an hour and 42 minutes. You can kind of see that here. So this is definitely warmed up. It's running at 100% and I can put my hand on the system, no problem. Like I can just leave it there. It's a little bit warm, but it's not crazy and I'm totally okay doing that. That's really the power of a solution like this where the cooling is plenty to handle the low power CPU. But just how low power is it? Well, let's start again and let me show you how low power this thing is. Okay, so let's talk about the idle power consumption for a second. Now, the power meter over here is reading somewhere in the nine and a half to maybe 12 and a half watt range. The idle power consumption on the SOC itself is around five watts or so. And something else that you're gonna see is that the just general clocks that you see just idle 
right, is you're gonna see about 400 megahertz on the E cores. So those things are throttled down a ton. And then the P cores, those things can be hitting three and a half gigahertz or more maybe. I mean, every little once in a while, you'll see this thing go well over four gigahertz on a single core. But let me show you what happens when we start to put this thing under load. So I'm gonna start running Stress NG on this, and you're gonna see that this thing is starting to just go. And for the first 15 seconds, the power meter will start to read about 40 watts. You also see that the overall package power consumption will hit somewhere in that 28 watt range. And the clocks during this 15 seconds of glory will hit somewhere around two and a half gigahertz on the E cores and around maybe three and a half gigahertz for the P cores. But to me, probably the most important thing is what happens after those 15 seconds. So we've had this going for a little bit now and you're gonna see that the overall package power consumption has gone from that like 28 watts down to about 15 watts. The overall system power consumption is somewhere around that 24 watt range. So it is much lower than that 40 watts that we saw at that peak. But the clock speeds have also decreased. We see 1.9 gigahertz on the E cores. We also see that sometimes that'll go down to like 1.8 gigahertz. And then the P cores, you know, those things will hit down to maybe about 2.3 gigahertz over time. So maybe the easiest way to think of this is that we're getting somewhere around that, you know, maybe nine and a half to 12 and a half watts at idle. Then you could get a couple seconds of glory in go fast for 15 seconds and then you're going to drop back down to reality when you hit about a 28 watt overall power consumption for this entire system. And that's super important when we look at our performance and then we look at the power consumption, you can tell why this is not necessarily the fastest CPU out there, but you still get pretty decent performance and you get low power consumption, which is awesome. With that though, it sounds like we're starting to get to our key lessons learned. So let's get to that next. Okay, with all of these videos, I like to have a key lesson learned. Like, what do we learn from this? Okay, so let's start out with the kind of obvious one, right guys? This is a $1,000-ish system. And so I know there are a lot of folks that are gonna say, hey, that's a lot more than some of the other like kind of fanless systems that you've reviewed. And 100% it is. But on the other hand, this thing has things like certifications for OSs. It's also designed with industrial components or industrial temp grade components, right? So if you do wanna go and put this out in the world, uh, this might actually be a better and more durable option. It's also also made by Supermicro, not some no-name company. Supermicro is a multi-billion dollar a year server vendor, and they also make embedded systems and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of folks just want to get a system from a vendor that they know, and they're willing to pay a little bit more for that. Now, I know other folks are still going to say, yeah, but it's still too expensive. And guys, really the reason that we're doing this system is because it's something that I think that, you know, a lot of folks that watch this and that read STH that, you know, are really looking for stuff like, hey, how do I apply things for my work environment? You know, a lot of people need embedded systems, right? They're all over the place. They're like, you know, every shop that you see, a lot of vehicles are in. I mean, they are just all the heck over the place. And I think that, you know, a system like this is interesting to a lot of folks. I think it's also just kind of cool to compare like, hey, what do you get from a big vendor versus like a no name vendor that maybe you've never heard of? Because of course, while this is fanless, there are degrees on like what you get with fanless systems, right? They're not all the same. Overall, it's hard not to love these single board computers. This three and a half inch drive size one, I think has a lot of power and there are different options. I really like the fact that you can order it with the heatsink, without a heatsink, so you can go put it in a chassis like this or you just buy it as an entire system. I think that's a really good benefit for folks, but I'd love to hear what you guys think down below. So definitely, light it up in the comments, guys. And hey, if you did like this video, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.